Amen. Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Uh, hey, Phoebe, great to see you. Lisa and Diana, great to see you. Hey, Nicole in Costa Rica, really great to see you. And uh, also, Andy, great to have you with us as well. <coughs> Good to see everybody tonight. So tonight we're going to talk about a sort of emotionally charged topic. It is the creation of vision. And tonight and then next week, we'll talk through three elements in the process of the creation of vision. And we're going to look really at insight, sight, and foresight. And by the way, if you missed uh, last week, please get that because it's really kind of uh, crucial in all of this with the understanding of what things can really block uh, the creation of vision. <clears throat> so we kind of talked through that last week. So let's talk about some confusion surrounding the concept of vision. Uh, Western pastors always preach on the word, whenever they preach on vision, they always preach on the word chazon as it relates to vision. Now, this is a sort of typical Strong's Concordance way of relating to ancient language. <laughs> In other words, they say, I want to talk about vision. Let's look in the Strong's Concordance and see what the Hebrew word or the Greek word is for vision. Um, and so then that's the word that they use. So can the word chazon be translated as vision? Yes, it can. But it's actually related to the seeing of a prophet, not to a personal vision, or and not to the casting of a vision for a church, for instance. As our Skip uh, friend Skip Mowen writes, you have no doubt heard the biblical axiom, without a vision, the people perish. For those of us, and I'm looking at a lot of us who've been sort of raised in the church, for those of us who have been around the church for a while, we have heard plenty of vision uh, sermons, and pretty much all of them, at least in my experience, have this verse, without vision, the people perish. It's often used uh, as an effort to establish a reason for existence for a congregation, Skip Moen writes. It attempts to use scripture to support the build it and they will come model to promote building projects and programs. One problem with this axiom is that it is only half of the verse from Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no chazon, vision, which actually is interpreted in the complete Jewish version as prophetic vision, which is a better interpretation. So where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps, which means guards and cherishes the Torah. Now, wow, that gives that verse a whole different meaning, doesn't it? Prevent prophetic vision imparts the Torah and the people keep it and they're happy. So <clears throat> notice the word vision is from the prophets and it's connected to keeping Torah. So this is not the same kind of vision as having a committee meeting to determine a congregation's vision. Now, let me just qualify. There's nothing wrong with doing that kind of vision for an organization. But here's where the confusion comes. It comes when an individual person is looking ahead and envisioning their preferred future. And we talked about that last week. Again, if you missed it, catch up. But we're kind of defining vision as a preferred future, how we see our preferred future. So they're envisioning their preferred future, but then that person is told to wait on God for a word before making any decisions or moving forward, right? So let me see if I can get this straight. <clears throat> it's okay for uh, a church board to meet, decide what their vision is, and how that looks lived out, everything from what kind of shirts the ushers wear to what the fonts on their website looks like, but it's not okay for a person in that community to have a vision of their own without some sort of supernatural voice speaking to them. <clears throat> this is the thing. There will always be contradictions in the Greek Western linear worldview, right? So let's look at uh, what it is, vision, concerning a person that has a vision 
for their own personal private lives. Another confusion happens when people think, when they're trying to determine this, that their dream or their vision is actually to kind of be found or discovered outside of themselves. So in other words, they feel like they don't know what it is and they're a little confused, so they go looking uh, to discover it outside of themselves. Hey Maureen, great to see you. Um, outside of themselves. So a vision is outside of themselves. So they go looking for a prophet or an astrologist or a psychic or their friends or their mother or whoever. And they're wanting somebody to tell them where they're supposed to go and what they're supposed to do. And what you actually get from that is someone else's ideas for you. Your vision comes from you. Oftentimes people say, well, I'm waiting on God. I'm waiting on God to tell me. And God is probably saying, I'm waiting on you. Why don't you tell me what you want to do in your life? I've already put, I'm the one who put those desires in your heart. Why don't you tell me what they look like? Speak to me what is in your heart. You know my Torah. How do you want to live it out in the world? So an interesting uh, visual with this is when we look at the Hebrew alphabet, right? Uh, the Hebrew alphabet is, as we know, the Hebrew word pictures and the letters have many different meanings and they're all really interesting. And these are ancient Hebrew pictographs. And again, before there was Hebrew letters, there was pictographs. And these are the 16th and 17th Hebrew letters in the alphabet, okay? And what we see here is two. We see Ein, the letter Ein, that's the 16th letter in the alphabet. And then we see the letter Pe, which is the 17th letter. Now an Ein is a picture of an eye. And Pe is a picture of a mouth. And this is really interesting imagery that we see here. Uh, many sages and scholars and commentators and rabbinic uh, writers believe that even the placement of Hebrew letters have meanings in their connections. So it's not so much that this these two letters spell anything, okay? I want to look at them in the placement of the Hebrew alphabet because most rabbinic scholars feel that everything has a purpose even in the placement. So we see the ayin and we see the pay. And again, the ayin is the site. Um, and it's this concept of that the rabbinic sources point to with these two letters, the concept of the eyes, the sight, being connected with the mouth, the communication. But here's the thing, the ayin comes first and gives insight and then sight. Then it is the pay or the mouth that gives insight and sight the expression. And we'll talk more about that next week in cultivating the vision. But these symbolic meanings connected with the eyes, the physical eyes, <clears throat> and the physical mouth, sight and communication that we see in the physical tangible mirror the spiritual intangible. So we know and we see even in the letters insight and sight is needed first in vision. One really interesting uh, verse about this is Psalm 115 and verse 16. And when we think about vision, it says, Heaven belongs to Adonai, but the earth he has given to humankind. Now, I want to ask for you to do this while we're kind of breaking this down a little bit. Um, because there's a lot of confusion and conflict as it relates to vision, right? So if you're feeling that you've had confusion or conflict as it relates to vision, or if you want to share a specific thing that maybe somebody said to you or a specific fear or whatever, or this is where I wish that they made the, an emoji of a, of a projectile vomiter. Because sometimes, you ever read something on Facebook and you say, you know, the angry face and the sad face just isn't enough. I want a puke face, right? But use the angry face, okay? <laughs> Since they don't make them yet. But as you're feeling something or thinking something, uh, let's talk through this tonight and see how this kind of confusion manifests in our life as it relates to our own 
personal visions. So Psalm 1, 15 and 16, heaven belongs to Adonai, but the earth he has given to humankind. Now, wait, wait a second. Isn't that contradictory? Doesn't it say the earth is the Lord's and the fullness therein? Which is it? Does, is the earth the Lord's or is the earth humankind's? Well, <laughs> this is not contradictory. This is not either or. This is not both and. This is actually, or this is both and. He's given us the earth to steward over, but he is king over the whole thing. So this verse is really important. Heaven belongs to Adonai, but the earth he has given to humankind. And when we understand that, that what we do on this earth, has, we've been put here for a purpose and he's given us this earth and all of the people that live in it have a commission to bring shalom, love, light into this world, right? So what does it look like when we actually take that seriously and say, hey, he's given me this responsibility. What does it look like in my life? And did, have you ever felt like that has been kind of stolen from you by either your friends who tell you, no, you're not supposed to do it that way, or even tragically the church that says, no, that's not the way it works. You have to do it this way. Uh, again, if you have a comment or a thumbs up or an angry face, let me see that now so that I know that you're tracking with this. And then Proverbs 16, 9, another verse that really can kind of cause uh, people some confusion. But these two verses are very important when it comes to vision. Proverbs 16, 9 says, A person may plan his path, but Adonai directs his steps. Now, I've heard this talked about negatively a lot. <laughs> They use this proverb as a negative thing. A person may plan his path, but Adonai directs his steps. Kind of like man makes his plans and God says, ha, huh. right? You've heard that. But this proverb is actually a positive affirmation. A person may plan his path. We're supposed to do that. <clears throat> but Adonai directs his steps. So plan your path. Don't wait for some sort of vision where the heaven opens up and God shows you exactly what you're supposed to do and you know exactly how you're supposed to get there. This is an affirmation. Plan your path, then God directs your steps. So it's us that he's entrusted with having vision for our lives in this world. Let me, see, let me say that again. And if you have a hard time tracking with that, put the sad face. But if you're feeling like, yeah, I'm really getting that for my life right now, I'm feeling that, let me see the thumbs up. I want to see where you're at. Um, again, I'm going to say that again. It's us that he's entrusted with having vision for our lives in this world. I'm seeing hearts. That's good. And it's him that guides and provides along the path. So do you see the, the balance there? Good, I'm seeing thumbs up. Great, great, great. Um, does anyone struggle some, some, wow, great, uh, thumbs up. Somebody is angry, um, meaning that they don't completely track with this, which is true because we've been um, given a lot of other messages. So yeah, this is an important thing. And remember, I always post these teachings on the membership group. And for those of you who I see are online with us right now, you're all members, so you can kind of read this again. Now, again, that's not to say that sometimes the Lord may externally give you a vision for something. If he does, great. But more commonly, he wants you to have your own. And keep in mind, he's the one who put those desires in your heart. He, he designed you with your personality, with your motivation, with your desires. So he's cool with it, okay? Uh, again, we get really confused about this. Um, let's just remind ourselves. Yahweh placed the vision of your preferred future in a place where he knew you couldn't miss it. Inside your heart inside your heart. 
So this vision that's inside of you, this passion actually comes from the Lord. And we're looking on the external uh, for it, but it actually is internal and it's been placed by God in our hearts. We just need to look within, which is insight. Now, let, let's, let's kind of like uh, put that in a practical way. So let's say that somebody, uh, let, let's put it like this. When I moved to Florida, okay? When I moved to Florida, it was because I started to get very, very sick. Um, I, most of you know this story, was exposed to stuff at 9-11, lived in mold. My cough got, I have a little cold right now, which is why I'm coughing, but uh, got sp exposed to mold, lived in mold because we lived in a church, got really, really sick, started to cough, and I'm a very healthy person in general, could not get rid of this cough, and it got worse and worse and worse until finally, uh, at the end of my time now, when I was teaching, and many of you remember this, I could barely, like right now, I'm really projecting my voice uh, for, the, for the microphone. I couldn't project at all. Uh, I couldn't even get through a sentence without coughing. So I heard a doctor one time said, you can't expect to get well where you got sick. And I just knew that I needed to get out of New York. I knew I needed to leave. I knew I would not be able to get healthy there. And did God speak to me? No, he did not. I just knew it. And so I started to pray, well, how's that going to happen? <coughs> how am I going to get out? And where are we going to go? And of course, there's money issues. And also, I had a faith community of people. And so, and I didn't want to leave one of them. So what did that look like? Uh, but I knew and I knew and I knew that I had to get out of New York for my health. And so I, we, as we prayed and as we thought about it, my husband had the ability to be able to change working for the same company and come to Tampa. And at the same time, when I was telling people in our faith community, uh, hey, I think I'm gonna have to leave New York, everyone said, well, you need to do Facebook teachings or some sort of venue like that, some sort of uh, model like that. So then I realized, oh, we can still be connected. I can still teach and people can still grow in community. So that would be the perfect example of vision. And then one of our faith community people moved down here as well, bought a house, had a mother-in-law apartment in the back, and we rent from him. So everything kind of fell into place. Now, just because things don't doesn't mean it's not a good vision, but for that, it was my own vision, my own desire to be well, to be healthy and it brought me in this path. So again, it's you need to look within, which is insight. <coughs> insight connects us to our likeness of God. So when we look in, when we look inside of our hearts, what we see is the likeness of God. Again, Genesis 1:27, uh, God said God it says so God created humankind in his own image. So when we look within, we see God's image. So when we speak of a vision for our lives, we're speaking about something that we will be and do that when expressed, enables others to see the Lord. And it can really be anything. Hey, I don't know if y'all are commenting or not, I saw comments before and I don't see any now, so um, if you are commenting um, and I don't respond back, I'm not ignoring you, it means it's not showing up. So again, it can be anything, anything at all that we have passion for, that we have a vision for, that kind of connects us uh, to life and it will reveal the Lord. Everything from, hey, I want to give my community kids dance lessons to hey, there's a park across the street from me and it's filthy. I think I want to take a day and clean it up. Um, I look at Out of Zion. Uh, Out of Zion, this uh, organization that we all are completely supportive of and is doing such a beautiful work. And as you know, Kasi and Jamie and Diana, who's with us now, uh, they lost their beautiful boy, Zion. And out of that pain and darkness, 
came this unbelievable vision of let's touch kids' lives that are terminally ill or challenged and let, let's give them the ability to create in art and music and dance and let's give them theater and let's take care of their parents while we're at it and then let's do a big show where everyone gets to celebrate the kids in life. And it doesn't matter who's sitting in that audience watching those kids. At that moment, every one of them sees the Lord and what's happening there. And this is what all visions do. Because again, we're image bearers. We're already image bearers. We just need to connect with our unique personalities and passions to create a vision from that. People uh, oftentimes say about vision, what if it's not what God wants for my life? Well, you know, I say this a lot, and um, I think most of you who have known me for a while, hey, Danielle, great to see you, honey. I think most of you who have known me for a while have heard me say this. But if the God who created this planet wanted to get your attention, I think he could. And on top of that, when he tells us no, we all know what that feels like, don't we? I mean, seriously, we know. It feels awful when we keep going when we know we're not supposed to. So that really shouldn't be a big concern, this paralyzing fear. What if it's not what God wants? If it's not what God wants for you because he loves you and he wants his best for you, he's going to tell you no, and he's going to tell you in no uncertain terms, no. And you're going to listen. But it, it, it's not hard to connect to what God wants as far as the vision is concerned. Because you find vision rooted in the Torah, which is what God wants. In other words, is it love? Is it peace? Is it joy? Is it kindness? Is it compassion? Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 14, some of my favorite text in scripture uh, it says this, for this mitzvah, which I am giving you today, is not too hard for you. It is not beyond your reach. It isn't in the sky so that you need to ask, who will go up into the sky for us, bring it to us, and make us hear it so that we can obey it. Likewise, it isn't beyond the sea so that you need to ask, who will cross the sea for us, bring it to us, and make us hear it so we can obey it. On the contrary, the word is very close to you, in your mouth, even in your heart. Therefore, you can do it. It's so beautiful. Hebrew language is so beautiful, so poetic. Again, that's Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 14. It's right there for you. It's in your heart and it's in your mouth. And this is why we need, in our visions, first is insight. We look inside of ourselves. It's already there. It's in our mouths. It's in our hearts. And we have got to be free in order to see. And that means undistracted. Frenzy is not a scheduling issue, right? It, it's a heart issue. <laughs> what, what we spoke about last week in the confrontation to vision teaching, and, other, and I know that was uh, kind of scientific, but it was so, so important. That confrontation to vision, one of the things is this high beta uh, brain waves, which is, a, which is stress. It's a stress perspective of the world. Uh, it's flight or fight. And you cannot connect or create when you're in survival mode. Your brain won't let you do it. When our heart becomes hardened or harried, we see the world through that when everything is a distraction or everything is too hard, but being free to see is out of those lower brain waves, those lower beta, which is learning, and alpha, which is connecting. Uh, and, it, and it connects to the present moment without fear of what if. And again, we're going to get more into that next week concerning the cultivation of a vision. If you feel that you're too hardened or too harried to see, to have insight in order to see that vision, how about this? I, I, got, a, I got a light bulb moment for you. Start with making insight your vision 
So the vision that you're going to take away tonight, Mary Lou, great to see you, honey. The vision that you're going to take away tonight is I have a vision where I'm going to have insight into my heart. So let's start with that, right? This is just an incredible uh, verse. And one again that confirms that what we have is here. We just need to look in. Ephesians 1.18a says, I pray that he will give light to the eyes of your hearts. Again, tonight with vision, we're talking about insight and sight. Light to the eyes of your hearts so that you will understand the hope to which he has called you. Our hearts see inside, and that's insight, what it, and what is in this present moment, and our preferred future, which is our vision, is what we see with our sight. The light to see with our hearts is already inside of us. We're designed to be able to see with insight. Let me see a uh, thumbs up if you really believe that or really want to believe that. The light to see with our hearts is already with us. We, again, let's, let's do this with a capital L. The light to see with our hearts, which is what this verse is saying, is already with us. We're designed to see with insight. <clears throat> then we can use that to see the sight which cannot yet be seen. Again, our future, our preferred future. Sight is used in the creative vision for our preferred future. So we see it as if it's real. Sight in vision, in this vision concept, is the art of seeing something even before it happens. Seeing it before it happens. If you don't have a future vision, and let me just kind of drill down on this for a second, because this is really important and, and real truth hear me, if you don't have a future vision, because you may just want to say, I'm afraid to have a future vision. Maybe it won't happen. Again, we're going to talk about that next week. Maybe I'm getting too full of myself. I'd rather just coast. If you don't have a future vision, you will default to what you know, which is what you've always done. <laughs> hear me. If you don't have a future vision, you will default to what you know which is what you've always done. A vision, the sight of your preferred future, envisioning the not yet seen, will then become your purpose or, or your compass. And that will lead you in a different direction. So again, so for all those who are a little bit uncertain, I'm not sure what my passion is, what my... Uh, vision is I'm not really sure about how I can bring God into this world and again it can be the simplest thing hey let's put it like this if you have a job that pays a lot of money and you're making tons and tons of money but you hate your life I mean you just hate it you're stressed you work all the time you have no balance you have no friends you just you're making a lot of money but you're not doing anything with your life and you say simply I don't want this life. I want a balanced life. I want to pay my bills. I want to enjoy my life. I want to have friends. I want to have family. I want to have a faith uh, experience that I can connect to. I want to have all that. So I'm going to, I feel like I want a new job and it's probably going to pay me less. It's okay if it does. And I'm, I'm going to quit this one and I'm going to get another job. So let's, or take another job. If that's your vision, that's a spiritual vision. That's not a selfish vision. That's a spiritual vision that brings God's presence into the earth. Because happy you, peaceful you, balanced you, loving you, bring shalom into the world. So anything that gets you to that spot is not selfish. Okay? Again, when we have desires and they're healthy and they connect us to truth, they're always going to bring about the presence of God in the earth. <laughs> So let's use the light of our own hearts to ask ourselves some questions here, to kind of prime the pump of envisioning preferred future. So let's just quote Marie, uh, Marie here, what sparks joy? <laughs> 
What sparks joy? So when was the last time you felt truly alive? So as I ask you these questions, think about it. When was the last time you felt truly alive? What makes you smile or even laugh? What does your best day look like? Who are you with when that best day happens? And what are you doing in that best day? And then as you're thinking about these, and again, for those of you who are members and you can uh, get this teaching and read the questions, I want to ask you another, let's do another scenario. And this is going to be even, even more intense, okay? If money was no object, so let's say you won the Mega Millions, okay? You have $139 million in your pocket now, right? Uh, after taxes, $139 million, you just won the Mega Millions, okay? Apart from remembering me, your shepherd, <laughs> Well, what would you do after you remembered the community and to bless all us, right? After you did that, after you spent money and traveled around the world and did all the things that you wanted to do and see all the things that you wanted to see and gave to all the organizations that you wanted to give to, let me ask you this. After all that, what would you do with your time? You have no financial pressure. You've given what you wanted, you've traveled where you wanted, you've done the experiences that you wanted. Now after that's over, how would you spend your time? That's kind of a real insight into where we're at. And if you say, I don't know, then again, refer back to our earlier conversation <laughs> about your first vision will be to get insight so you can see inside your heart. How would you spend your time? We get this vision, this image, this story, this picture. As Aristotle said, the soul never thinks without a picture. So we're picture driven. Envision it, imagine it. And so we use insight to see what our heart longs for. We use sight to envision that lived out in our preferred future. So insight and sight as part of vision. Next week we'll do foresight. <clears throat> as the psalmist wrote, this is such a beautiful question. What if I wholly believed to see the goodness of God in this land of life? Let me read this again because it's so beautiful, such a powerful question. What if I wholly believe to see the goodness of God in this land of life? In other words, what if I could really and truly know that I would see God's goodness in my life and in this world? No fear. No failure. Now, what does your vision in God's goodness in your life look like? And what does your vision look like? feel like when you see it. Shabbat Shalom, all you visionaries. I love you. <laughs>